we talked then about various kinds of heat cycles, and I showed that you can represent each heat cycle as a certain loop on a pressure volume diagram. Okay, so this is an example of the Carnot cycle. So suppose then I gave you a cycle like this, and I wanted you to calculate what's the efficiency, how much heat goes in and out of the cycle. Uh, now in general, you can't calculate this. So if I show you a picture like this and I ask you what the work is, W net, that you can calculate because the net work is just the area here. So I've given you enough, enough information to calculate the net work. Okay? But in general, if I ask you how much heat has gone in or how much heat has gone out in each stage, then you do not have enough information to calculate this. In order to be able to calculate this and therefore calculate the efficiency of the cycle in general, you need to know something about the behavior of the system. So for example, in a steam engine, you need to know that it starts off as a liquid, it turns into a gas. How does it behave when it's a liquid? How does it behave when it's a gas? Okay. So in order for you to be able to look at a cycle like this and calculate everything about the heat cycle, you need to know a bit more information about the substances used, for example, the steam in the steam engine or just air in this little model Stirling engine. So I want to give you some equations which will allow you to do this. And we're going to look at one very simple system, which is known as the ideal gas. Um, so the ideal gas is a kind of idealized, simplified set of equations for how a gas behaves. And there are two equations which tell you everything you need to know, which are known as the equations of state. The first one tells you that if you multiply the pressure by the volume, this is equal to the number of particles in the gas times some constant, which is known as Boltzmann's constant, and I'll write as Kb, times the temperature of the gas measured in Kelvin. Okay. The second equation tells you that the internal energy of the gas is equal to the number of particles in the gas times the constant volume heat capacity which itself is assumed to be a constant times the temperature. So if I explain every term in these equations then, well, okay, pressure, volume, and temperature, we, we know all along. N is the number of particles. Which in general will be a very large number for any realistic system. Kb is known as the Boltzmann constant. It has to be calculated experimentally, and it's found to have a value of approximately 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23, and its units are joules per Kelvin. So that's an experimental constant which is found U is the internal energy of the gas. How much energy does the whole gas have? Energy. And then finally, Cv. Well, we know it's the heat capacity at constant volume, but in this case, it's per particle, right? which is the heat capacity at constant volume. volume per particle. Okay. 
So that defines these two equations exactly. And CV itself, for most gases, has quite a simple value. If you take a monotonic gas, that's something like helium, where there's only one atom in each molecule, then you find, to a very good approximation, CV is approximately 3 over 2 times the Boltzmann constant. If you take a diatomic gas, an example of diatomic, that means two atoms in the molecule, oxygen, right, then you find, to a good approximation, CV is about 5 half. If it's a more complicated gas, we like something like ammonia, which has four atoms per molecule, then CV will <coughs> be different. Okay. But for these simple cases of a monatomic and diatomic gas, at room temperature, to a very good approximation, these are the values. Um, so this allows you to model air pretty well. Air itself is about 20% oxygen and 78% nitrogen, 2% other stuff. So therefore, for the air, CV is approximately 5 halves KV. Because most of the molecules in the air were diatomic. Right, so these two equations completely define everything about the ideal gas. And so if I tell you that an ideal gas is used in a heat cycle, it, they enable you to calculate everything about the heat cycle. How much heat goes in and out of the system, how does its internal energy change, and so on. However, so far they're not very practical because they assume that you need to know the number of particles, and it's very difficult to count the number of particles. Right? So if I take the Stirling engine here and I ask you how many particles are inside, that's something which is hard to know, right? it's something which is hard to count. So, I mean, on some level you have to calculate it, but this is simplified by using the concept of one mole of substance. So this is a concept which enables you to use the equations of an ideal gas without having to actually count how many particles are in the gas. Okay. Okay. So you may have already seen the definition of this. It's commonly used by chemists. You say one mole of substance is equal to the molecular mass of that substance in grams. Okay, sorry, I should probably write that exactly. It's equal to the molecular mass in grams. Okay. So this is most easily explained through examples, I think. So, for example, if you look at normal hydrogen gas, hydrogen is made up of, it's, well, the atomic mass of hydrogen is one. Right? This is one proton in it. So you've got two atoms, each of which with a molecular atomic mass of one. So one mole <coughs> of hydrogen is equal to two grams. One plus one is two. So the molecular. The molecular mass is 2, so 1 mole is 2 grams. Okay. If you look at oxygen, oxygen has an atomic weight of 16, right? and there are 2 atoms in a molecule, so therefore 1 mole of oxygen is equal to 32 grams. And one final example 
if we look at water, H2O, then hydrogen has atomic mass of 1, and there's two of them, so that's 2. Oxygen has an atomic mass of 16, so it's 1 plus 1 plus 16, which is 18. So one mole of water is equal to 18 grams. So that's the definition. The reason this is useful is, for example, if you look at hydrogen and oxygen, oxygen is 16 times heavier than hydrogen. And one mole of oxygen is 16 times heavier than one mole of hydrogen. So that means that the number of hydrogen molecules in one mole of hydrogen is equal to the number of oxygen molecules in one mole of oxygen, and is equal to the number of water molecules in one mole of water. So instead of counting the number of molecules, you can just count the number of moles, and you know that the ratio of the number of particles is the same. So finally, you just need to know then how many molecules in one mole and this is called Avogadro's number and experimentally again it's something you have to measure experimentally and it's found to have a value of about 6.02 times 10 to the minus 20, sorry, 10 to the plus 23 <laughs> particles per mole. So you see it's a very large number of particles as you would expect. So then if you know how many moles of substance you have and you know Avogadro's number, then you can calculate how many particles you have. Because the number of moles times Avogadro's number tells you how many particles you have. So this number itself is very difficult to measure, Avogadro's number. So next time, one of the things we're going to do is explain how experimentally you can calculate this. So experimentally, how can you count the number of for example, how many hydrogen molecules are in two grams of hydrogen? How can you count this? Okay. Um, so this allows you to change the equations of state for the ideal gas in, from talking about numbers of particles to talking about numbers of moles. So suppose that we have n moles then this is equal to n times Na particles. The ideal gas equations of state can be rewritten to take terms, accounts of numbers of moles rather than number of particles. For example, you have that PV is equal to n times the Boltzmann constant times the temperature. But if I say that n is just equal to the number of moles times Avogadro's number, this is equal to n times Na times Kb times P. This is just the number of particles. And then this is also written then n. These two constants, Avogadro's number and Boltzmann constant, are combined into a single constant, which is called the molar gas constant, and given the symbol R. So R is equal to the product of Avogadro's number and the Boltzmann constant. And it turns out that this turns out to be a number near unity. Na is 10 to the 23, Kb is 10 to the minus 23. So those cancel and you get 8.31-ish. Okay. And the units are...
Jules Pekelvin Hermo. Yeah, I think so. Okay. So instead of dealing with the equation of states in terms of number of particles like this, you can deal with the equation of states in terms of moles like this. And all you have to do is replace Boltzmann constant by this molar gas constant like this. You also have the, equa the second equation of state, which says that U is equal to NCB times temperature. Well, in this case, I'll do it separately. If we've got a monatomic case, then CV was just 3 halves K, so then N is U is equal to N times 3 halves K times T. And again, you can write this down in terms of moles. N is equal to the number of moles times Avogadro's constant. So Avogadro's constant is multiplied by this and absorbed into the molar gas constant. So this turns out to be 3 halves number of moles molar gas constant times T. And the similarly, if you do it for a diatomic case, then you find that U is 5 halves number of moles times molar gas constant times T. Okay, so I, I told you that if I tell you that a system is using an ideal gas, this allows you to calculate all of the properties of the heat cycle. So let me just show you for that now. Let me just show you that now. Um, so we talked about various different kinds of expansions. And remember, you can always plot them on a pressure volume diagram. There was the isobaric <coughs> expansion, which had a constant pressure. There was the isothermal expansion, which had a constant temperature. And then there was the adiabatic expansion, which had no heat transfer. And most of the heat cycles we'll talk about are made up of these three kinds of expansions. Okay. So I'm going to show you that you can find everything you need to know. So how do you find the change in internal energy, the heat transfer, and the work done for an ideal gas? In each kind of expansion. So we can say that the work done is equal to, the definition is it's equal to the integral from V1 to V2 of pressure dV. Okay. But this, because pressure is a constant, this just integrates simply as P times V2 minus V1. We can calculate the change in internal energy so remember that my equation was okay mm. we had these two equations of state right first one is PV is equal to n times Boltzmann constant times temperature the second one is that u is equal to n heat capacity as temperature. Okay. Now in the second one, N and the heat capacity are constants, so the change in U is entirely given by the change in temperature. So in other words, this is equal to N K B, sorry, N C B. Delta T, which I can write as N C B times T2 minus T1. So here I used the equation number 2. Okay, so we can put these two things together to find out what the change in heat is using the first law of thermodynamics. 
if we look at this expression, you've got PV2. According to the first equation of state, this must just be equal to N times KB times T2. And PV1, similarly, is equal to N times KB times T1. So therefore, you can conclude that the work done is equal to N times KB times T2 minus T1. So now we have similar looking expressions for the change in internal energy as well as the work done by the gas. And the final thing we need to find is the change in heat transferred Q. And this is quite simple to do using the first law. The first law of thermodynamics tells you that the change in energy is equal to Q minus W. So therefore, Q is equal to delta U plus W. And if we combine those two equations, which we worked out over there, you see that this is equal to N times CV plus KB times the change in temperature, T2 minus T1. So that's the final. So we've worked out the change in internal energy, the work done, and the heat transferred for an isobaric expansion of an ideal gas, given by these three equations I put in blue. Now, one important thing you can see from here is a relationship between the heat capacity at constant volume and the heat capacity at constant pressure. The heat capacity at constant pressure per particle, which is what I'm going to call this, this is the heat capacity at constant pressure per particle. This is defined as being equal to the heat Q divided by the change in temperature per particle is 1 over N. Okay. How much heat do you need to get a change in temperature? And from here you can see Q divided by delta T divided by N is just equal to CV plus KB. So for an ideal gas, you have this very simple relationship that the heat capacity at constant pressure is just equal to the heat capacity at constant volume plus the Boltzmann constant. Right. So that completely defines all of the things we need to know about an isobaric expansion. The next case we're going to look at is the isothermal expansion. And in an isothermal expansion, temperature is a constant. So, if temperature is a constant, and as we said before, the change in internal energy only depends upon the change in temperature, then it follows that the change in internal energy is zero, right? Change in internal energy using equation number two is equal to N times CV times the change in temperature, but there is no change in temperature, so for an isothermal expansion, there is no change in energy. Right? Next, we can calculate the work done. The work done is equal to, by definition, the integral of the pressure, the volume, <coughs> So we need to be able to write the pressure as a function of volume, but we can use now the first equation of state, which tells you that pressure is just equal to N times KB times the temperature divided by the volume QB.
Now, in this case, it's isothermal, so T is a constant. So these are all constants, so this is just 1 over V dV, and that integrates to give you a log. So this is just NKBT times the logarithm of V2 over V1. Okay, and finally, we've got to find what is the heat transferred, but this is very easy. The first law, again, tells you that delta U is equal to Q minus W, but delta U is zero, so therefore Q, the heat transferred, is the same as W for an isothermal expansion. And the adiabatic expansion is defined by the condition that there is no heat transfer. So immediately you get one thing for free. So in this case, the first law tells you that delta U is just equal to minus W. So if I find, calculate the change in internal energy, then I immediately know what the work done is as well. Okay. And using the first of these, sorry, the second of these equations of states, we can say that the internal energy is equal to N times Cv, times the change in temperature, T2 minus T1. So that specifies everything for the adiabatic case as well. Q is zero, so U, delta U is minus W, and delta U is this. However, it's useful to get one more result for the adiabatic case. Sometimes you don't know the change in temperature. You may only know, for example, the change in volume. So it's useful to get a relationship between the change in volume and the change in temperature in the adiabatic case. Okay. So let me do that now. Okay. So the first law tells you that the change in internal energy is minus the work done. So this means if I change the internal energy by a little bit du, then this is equal to minus the change in the work minus dw, which is equal to the pressure times the change in the volume dv. Sorry, with a minus sign, of course. Now, I can rearrange this to get, well, first of all, du, the first law, uh, well, the first and second law. I can use the second law, sorry, the second equation of state to rewrite du as n times Cv times the change in temperature. And I can use the first law to rewrite P as minus n k b t over v d v. Okay, so I've got this equation. You see the n's cancel. Okay. So I can rearrange this to tell me that 1 over t times the change in temperature is equal to k b over c v times minus times 1 over volume change in volume and then we can integrate these equations so the integral from t1 to t2 of 1 over t dt is equal to minus kb over cv the integral from v1 to v2 1 over v dv okay. these are both simple logarithms right so you get that the log T2 over T1 is equal to minus KB over CV times the log of V2 over V1. And then finally, you can exponentiate this to get that 
the ratio T2 over T1 is equal to V2 over V1 to the power minus KB over CB. And you can do a similar analysis. Um, the calculation is more or less the same, so I don't want to do it. To get a relationship between the temperature and the pressure. So it's useful to know, but I don't have to do the calculation again. You can show also that T2 over T1 is equal to Sorry, no, no, no. You can also say that the pressure, T2 over P1, is equal to V2 over V1 to the power of minus 1 plus KB over CB. It's a similar sort of calculation for the temperature. And this is as nicely written if you remember that for the ideal gas, Cv plus Kb is the heat capacity at constant pressure. This is equal to minus the ratio of the heat capacity. So that's the second equation, which is quite useful to know. So just before we finish, I said the reason I wanted to talk to you about this ideal gas is that you can use it to calculate the, for example, efficiencies of a real heat cycle. So I want to do that now for the case of a model Stirling engine. So in particular, I, I calculated some values for this engine. Um, assuming that the air is an ideal gas, we can calculate how much work does this engine do and what its efficiency is. So remember the heat cycle of the Stirling engine looks like this. There's two processes at constant volume and then two isothermal processes like this. Okay. And I assume that for this model Stirling engine I, I made calculated some values. I estimate the volume that's the volume inside of this container here, to be about 30 centimeters cubed. Okay. And you should really work in meters cubed to get the answer in joules. So this is 3 times 10 to the minus 5 meters cubed. I estimate that the change in volume is about, by the drive piston moving up and down, is about 1 centimeter cubed. In other words, 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters cubed. So on the diagram here, this point is V0. This point is V0 plus delta V. That's how much it expands. And the temperatures, well, if we do it with coffee, then you can reasonably expect the high temperature coffee to be at about 80 degrees C, which in Kelvin is 353. And low temperature is room temperature, which we can take to be about 20, which is 293 in Kelvin. So I'm going to use these values as approximate values for this Stirling engine here, and then we'll calculate how much, how much work it's doing. Right, so the work done, if I call this one A, B, D. The work done W net is equal to the work done from A to B minus the work done from C to D. Right? It's the area inside the cycle. Now these are two isothermal processes. So 
A to B is at the high temperature, so we use the isothermal the expressions we calculated, so that was that the work done is the number of particles times the Boltzmann constant times the temperature. Well, the first one is at high temperature times the log of the change in volumes. So that's V0 plus delta V divided by V0. So that's the work done there. And the second one, the change in volume is exactly the same, except the temperature is lower. So it's just minus NKB TL log V0 plus delta V over V0. So the network done is equal to, I'll write it in a bit of a funny way, NKB times the low temperature times the ratio of the temperatures times the log of the change in volume. Okay, um, so that's an expression. The only problem now is we don't know how many particles are in that thing. That's a bit tricky to calculate, but we can now use the first equation of state, which tells you that the pressure in the gas times the volume, for example, V0, should be equal to the number of particles times Kb. And we assume that at low temperature, this is atmospheric pressure. So at low temperature, this is atmospheric pressure, which tells you that this is approximately equal to 1 times 10 to the 5 times V0, which is 3 times 10 to the minus 5, which is equal to 3. So NKVTL is approximately equal to 3. So therefore, the work done is approximately equal to 3 times the ratio of temperatures, that's 353 three divided by 293 minus 1 times the log of the change in volume. That's 3.1 times 10 to the minus 5 divided by 3 times 10 to the minus 5. 10 to the minus 5 don't actually matter in the calculation. And that is an estimation of the amount of work which this Stirling engine is doing over one cycle. And you can calculate that now. And this turns out to be approximately 0.02 joules. Okay. So the amount of work it done is over one cycle is very, very small, in other words. Okay. So you'd expect that because it's just a little toy. It's not a proper engine designed to do work. So when it's running on a cup of coffee, once the wheel goes around once, one turn of the wheel, it generates about 0.02 joules of energy. Okay. So assuming that air is an ideal gas allows us to calculate this. So that's why we need the ideal gas equations. Okay. Okay, I'm going to do just a little bit more calculation. We can, I want to calculate the efficiency as well. So in order to do that, we need to calculate the heat going in. Heat goes in, firstly here, when the pressure is increasing, and secondly here in the isothermal expansion. Okay. So we need to calculate Q in, and then we can calculate the efficiency. So Q in is equal to the heat going in from the stage CA plus the heat going in the stage A, B. Okay. In this first stage, there is no change in volume. It's a constant volume, which means that there is no work done, which means that the heat is just equal to the change in internal energy. And in this case, it's isothermal. That means there's no change in internal energy, which means that Q 
is equal to W, which fortunately we've already calculated. Is it constant temperature? There's no change in internal energy, so Q is equal to W. So that allows us to calculate the heat in. So the first term is just U, and the change in U is N times CV times the change in temperature. So that's TH minus TL. And we've calculated this already. It's the same as that. Right? Oh, no, it's not the same as that. Sorry. It's equal to N KB TH times the log of V0 plus delta V over V0. And you can calculate this in the same way as I did before, assuming that air is a diatomic ideal gas, which means we can take CV is equal to 5 over 2 times the Boltzmann constant. And if you make this assumption, then you can calculate this thing. And it turns out that the heat going in over one cycle is approximately 1.65 joules. So as this wheel goes round once, it absorbs an amount of heat, 1.6 joules approximately, and it gives out an amount of work, 0.02 joules. So we've been able to calculate the values for that, and we can therefore calculate the efficiency. Efficiency is equal to the work done divided by the heat going in, and this turns out to be 0.012, or in other words, 1.2%. So the efficiency of this model Stirling engine is very low. You have to take in a lot of heat to give you just a little bit of work. So it's not an efficient engine. We can calculate using the Stirling engine result the max possible efficiency is equal to the difference in temperatures divided by the temperature of the high temperature reservoir. And if you do that for these numbers, you find out that the maximum possible efficiency between the temperature of a cup of coffee and the room temperature is about 17%. So the maximum possible efficiency you could get for this machine is 17%. In fact, by calculating for an ideal gas, we get an efficiency of about 1.2%. Right, so this is an example which illustrates what I've been the reason I've been talking about the things I've been talking about today. If we plot the heat cycle on a pressure volume diagram, and we assume that the cycle is using an ideal gas, then we can calculate, for example, how much work is done in the cycle, how much heat is absorbed by the cycle, and what's the efficiency of the cycle. So by combining the shape of the cycle, which is the first thing I talked about, and the equations for the ideal gas, which is the second thing I talked about, you can calculate everything you need to know about the heat cycle.